Well, uh, I've been married over 30. How, how many of you have been married over 30 years? Again, raise your hand. And how many of y'all have it all figured out? Come right back down with that hand, right? Honestly, no matter how long you're married, is there still things that you can learn to make it better? Yes or no? Yes. If you're not married, some of you are in here this morning and think, well, you know, I got the Sunday off and, uh, you know, Pastor Dan can't hit me between the eyes today because I'm not married. Well, but you may be married one day. So this, these are things and there's principles we're going to give that are just good on relationships in general that I think will be helpful to you. So let's take our Bible and go to 1 Peter chapter 3. And that's New Testament. If you're using the, uh, the Bible there uh, uh, under your seats, then uh, we want you to grab that. Adam, if you could get me a handout. Uh, I need a, need a handout, man. All right. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, yeah, so it's page number 1261 in your handout. 1261, actually in your Bible. 1261 in your Bible. Aren't you glad we don't have 1,200 pages in your handout today, amen? You guys will be like, we'll be here all morning, right? <laughs> uh, how many of you would agree with me, communication's a big issue in marriage? You, if you agree with that, say amen, huh? Communication. Uh, a lack of communication leads to complete marriage breakdown, and we all know that. Two people meet, and they start dating, right? And eventually, let's say they get married. Most of the time, it begins with a friendship. You know, you develop a friendship. And you share things with each other. You confide in each other. You discuss things. You talk. And when a, when a dating couple uh, shares their time, they usually have two basic, maybe unconscious goals, but two goals. When you're dating, you want to get to know each other more thoroughly. You want to get to know that other person. And then the second goal is, especially if you are pursuing that further, other than just a date, you know, you, you're like, man, I want to pursue this. Not only do you have the goal to get to know each other more thoroughly, but the second goal is that you want to let each other know how much you care for each other. And so the question is, why should those two goals be dropped after the wedding? Uh, obviously, they shouldn't. And that's where communication comes in. What's communication? In your handout, I got a definition. I want you to look at it, all right? It says that true communication is to realize in practice, in your everyday living, the oneness that God declares about your position as husband and wife. So if you're married, the Bible says that two become what? One what? One flesh. So there's a oneness that comes between you and your spouse. So Communication is when you're living that oneness out in your daily life. You're actually living that. You're exemplifying that in your daily life. And there's an important principle here in your handout that I want you to get. It says that communication is not just talking. Uh, sometimes you can talk, but you're not really communicating. Uh, and, and, and so true communication is not just talking. M communication is true, heartfelt sharing of life together, all right? You're sharing life together. You're not just sharing an address. You're not just sharing kids. You're not just sharing, uh, you know, um, the, the, the things that you own, but you, there's a sharing of life together. There's a, a growing knowledge and a, and a growing understanding of each other. Remember last week we talked about the five purposes of marriage, and we talked about partnership, and that's kind of what I'm really going to kind of really focus in on today that aspect of marriage that has to do with partnership. You're one flesh. Um, what, what happens when communication breaks down in marriages? And I'm sure that in a crowd this size, um, there's marriage struggles that are going on right now as, as we are meet here together. That's okay um, because we at Crossroads understand that. We get that. We want to help. We have marriage counseling. Uh, we have a certified counselor on, here at our church that is excellent. He's got a staff that works with him. We offer this free to couples because we know that marriage can be a struggle. And many times you're not living out that oneness that God declares about you. So we want to help. But when the communication begins to break down, then in your handout it says drifting apart is what happens, drifting apart. And, and, and whenever you have a drifting apart in marriage, 
that leads to a host of other issues. It leads to a laundry list of other problems uh, that, that come. So communication is so very, very important. So what I want to focus on is this. How, how do you continue to develop? I don't care if you've been married 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. How do you continue to develop that togetherness, that oneness in marriage? And the first thing I want to talk about today from the Bible is the social element of marriage because it's so very important. And, and there's a, a key statement in your handout that I really want you to get. And, here, and we're going to go to the Bible and we're going to see this in a second. But I want you to get this statement first. It says that if, if you're going to have that oneness, that communication, you absolutely have to spend time together. That is essential. And I know right away, yeah, but, but we got jobs and we got different hours we work and we got the kids doing this and we got this and we got that. I'm just telling you flat out, you have to figure it out. I'm not... I can't sit here and figure it out for you. All I can tell you is you got to figure that out. Because if you don't figure out how to spend time together, then what happens is you can both get very comfortable not being together. And that is a recipe for disaster. Now, I want to go to 1 Peter 3, 7. All right, let's look at it. 1 Peter 3, 7. And this is kind of the centerpiece of, uh, of our study today. This is the centerpiece of what I'm going to be talking about, this verse, and it's really a great verse. The context is marriage, and he's writing to husbands, and he says, likewise, you husbands, husbands. So he's writing to husbands. And then he says, dwell with them, and he's talking about their wives. He says, dwell with them, dwell with your wife according to what? Knowledge. Now, the word dwell there. It means, uh, it means to reside together, together, to, to be together, dwell with them, be together with them. And uh, man, this is so, in modern day lingo, we'd say hang together, you know, you need to hang together. He says dwell with them, hang together according to knowledge. Know your wife, know what's going on in her heart, know what her desires are, know your wife, dwell with her, hang with her, be together with her according to knowledge. Giving honor, and that word honor there, if you look it up, it literally means value. He says give, you want to place a high value on her. So place high value on your wife. As under the weaker vessel, and that's just talking about physically, the physical differences between a man and a woman. Be sensitive to that, right? Don't, don't work her to death, guys. Amen? All right. Thank you. Got, got an amen from a lady. Amen. <laughs> Ladies, it's okay to say amen, especially on a message like this, all right? Um, but uh, yeah, that, don't work her to death, you know? Be sensitive to her as, as someone who typically... The wife's going to be weaker physically, not less valuable. No, he says put high value on her, see? And then as being heirs together, look at that word, heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. So in your handout, look at Ephesians 5.29. I got another verse there, and it, and it basically says the same thing. It says, again, the context is marriage. No man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it even as the Lord the church. And what he's talking about there is the way you treat your body is the way you should be treating your wife. And he says that you should nourish and cherish your wife like you do your own body. And if you look up that word cherish, it carries the idea of delighting in each other's company. You delight in her company. You hold her dear. There's a verse in there that I, I had in the handout last week, and it's a good one. Look at Song of Solomon 5.16. The bride is speaking in this one about her bridegroom. And she's, remember that? His mouth is most sweet. How many of you guys, your wife told you this week you got a sweet mouth? Anybody? His mouth is most sweet. Yea, he is altogether lovely. And then she says about her husband, this is my beloved, and she says, this is my what? Friend. I love her and my friend. Now, friendship can reach its zenith in marriage because the other loves of the relationship enhance it. So the, the bond is closer in marriage. The setting is more secure. But, but, friendship in marriage is by no means a sure thing. 
Uh, friendship and marriage does not automatically happen when the vows are said and the rings are exchanged. In fact, friendship is something that is strangely absent from most marriages. And that's why so many marriages are weak and so many marriages today are unsatisfying. You get two people that exist together. They may have some occasional romantic moments. They may have some occasional happy moments. But that daily, day in, day out joy, satisfaction that comes from being best friends is just simply not there in so many marriages. And it needs, it needs to get there. You got to get it there. All right. And that's what we're going to talk about. It's about helping you to get it there. So... How are you, how, think about this. How are you going to forge that oneness that God talks about? How are you going to forge that intimate friendship in marriage if you don't spend time together? As we said, it's not going to happen automatically. Life can get busy. Can I get an amen to that, huh? Life gets busy. Life can swallow up all your time, if you allow it to, to where there's no time left for each other. And that's why many marriages struggle to survive today. That's why many marriages are on life support, you know. It's, it's because married, in your handout it says that married couples that are not living and functioning as one flesh are not best friends. It's just not going to be there. If you're not living and functioning as one flesh, see, it's not just a positional thing that God declares. God wants you to live that out. So if you're not living out that oneness in your daily life, then you're not going to be best friends. And here's what I've seen happen a lot, is that, uh, Rob, can I have a little bit more of the monitors? The wife tries, what, what happens is when you're dating, have you guys ever noticed that when you're dating, you try to put on your best face? And, and, and you put on your best face, and you want to please that other person so much, right? Because you're trying to snag them. And so the wife try then what happens is then you get married and the wife tries to change the husband's interest after marriage which she puts up with when they're dating and may even act like she likes it oh i love football this is so much fun spending all day watching football with you i love this in the back of her mind she's thinking once we get married this too will change amen <laughs> and he's uh he's all grinning and happy when they go to the mall shopping I love shopping. You do? Most guys don't like shopping. Really? I love shopping, you know. In the back of his mind, he's thinking, you know, this is going to stop once we get married. But, you know, what happens is she tries to change his interest, and then he feels like she's cramping his style. So to avoid that, he spends time with his buddies. Well, that means that some of his most enjoyable activities and his happiest moments happen without his wife present. And then family tensions come, right? Family responsibilities, and that brings tension. So now this guy's got only so much time. So now he has to choose between his buddies and his activities, the things he likes to, or his wife and his family. So when he tries to split time, his wife many times will resent that. She thinks, well, man, if he's going to take time off, he should spend it with me and spend it with the kids. Or she'll just fill that void with her kids or with other activities of her own. The social element of, and then that drifting apart happens. The social element of your marriage and communication is very crucial. If, if married couples are to be companions, they're to be best friends, in your handout's a key statement, and I believe this with all my heart. If you're going to be best friends, I'm just telling you, if you, and there's a lot of blessings and there's a lot of benefits that come, man, when you're a best friend with your spouse, there is such a joy. There's just so many dividends that come when you are best friends and you're living out that oneness that God wants you to have. But I'm telling you, it's not just going to happen. In your handout, it says you have to engage in regular social and recreational activities that they can both enjoy together. I want you to write that in. So you have to engage in things that you can both enjoy together. This is crucial. This has to do with what he talks about in the Bible, about living out that oneness, knowing each other, res uh, dwelling with them, you know, hanging with them. In your handout, it says those great moments, those great moments of fun, relaxation, and enjoyment. You want to associate those feelings with your spouse, not somebody else. Um, in, the, in the busyness of our culture today, boy, it is a busy culture. It really is. It's not like back when, 
you know, we lived in a rural society. It's, it's a busy culture. I mean, think about it. You can be across town in 10 minutes now, you know, and, and it used to not be that way. When, we, when you lived in a rural culture, things were a lot slower. But now, in the busyness of our culture, couples, it's very important. I'm talking about having a good marriage here. Couples have to, they have to give their time in areas that bring them together, not fragment their relationship. You know, and, I, and again, I'm not, I'm not up here saying that couples have to spend every waking moment with each other, but usually our work does enough of that for us, separates us enough to where when work is over, couples should pursue interests together. Now, I'm a firm believer in that. Now, I've been married 31 years. I'm not a novice here anymore. I, um, hard to believe we're not young marrieds anymore, honey, but... Uh, you know, um, we've been married 31 years, and um, I really believe that, that you have to have this. You, you ha- There's just no doubt that Denise is my best friend, period. I mean, that's it. There's nobody else I'd rather be with, no one else I'd rather hang with. It, she is my best friend, and that didn't just happen. Those are choices that were made. You have to have that, that partnership, because here's what will happen. Over time... It's, you know, if you're not coming together, if you're letting life fragment you, then what happens is over time it takes its toll. And even if the wife accepts that, she's like, oh, I'm okay with that. You go on, do your thing. You, you, that's not okay because you'll begin to drift. And, and, it, and many times it happens very slowly and gradually over time to where you don't even really realize what's going on, you know, until... Many times it's like, wow, you're in 911 mode, you know. But, you know, you go back to 1 Peter 3 7. Look at that again. Look at 1 Peter 3 7. And it says, Husbands, dwell with them. You need to be with your wife. Be together with her. That's what that means. Be with her. Be together with her. Hang with her according to knowledge, giving honor, great value unto the wife. So, do you all agree that the Bible is right? Do you all think the Bible knows what it's talking about? Yes or no, huh? Yeah, that's a Bible, man. That's God's Word. God knows what He's talking about. And it's extremely important. Now, I want to get real practical for just a few minutes, all right? And I want to, I want to share with you some, some practical things. Because there's always the issue of, okay, how do I obey God's Word? I see it. I know it's there. I know the Bible teaches I'm one with my wife, you know, I'm one with my husband. I know that the Bible teaches I need to live out that oneness. I know the Bible teaches I need to nourish her. I need to cherish her. I need to delight in her company. I need to honor her and put great value on her and let her know she's greatly valued. And, and I know that I need to know her inside and out. And the only way to do that is spending time with her. So I know what the Bible says, but how do I do that? How do I have that strong partnership? How do, we, how do we forge that? You know, no matter how long we've been married, we can do that. So how do we do that? How do we do what God wants us to do? So I want to give you some practical things. The first one is this. Number one is that uh, downtime should be spent. Does anybody want to take a guess on the blank? You got it. You guys are prophets. How about that, huh? Downtime should be spent together. That's right. Days off should be coordinated and spent together. Um, Find hobbies that you both enjoy together. Why should your most enjoyable moments in life be spent with somebody else? You know, you're supposed to be best friends. You're supposed to be one flesh. There's supposed to be that partnership. You know, you see, and some of you are like, yeah, well, you, you, mean, you mean I got to give up something that I like to do? Hey, you know what? It may mean you have to give up something that you enjoy doing, but so what? So what? Isn't it worth it if you get to be with your best friend and your partner? I mean, there are dividends in other areas. I mean, it's worth it. So find something that you both enjoy doing, all right? We'll talk more about that in a minute. But number two, um, this is a biggie, I think. Vacations, day trips, fun getaways should always be done together. 
Um, I am such a believer in this. Um, why would I want to take a vacation and have a blast without my wife there? It just doesn't make any sense to me at all. Why would I want to have a great time and go do something and then not have my best friend there, you know? So, you know, you, you have to do these things together. Make a commitment. Um, I was talking to a guy down the street from us. Uh, so he lives down the street, and he and his wife have been married for years. And, and she died pretty suddenly. And he said, man, I'm just lost, you know? He says... You know, we had some cruises and different things planned, he said, and I, I've tried to go and do them, he said, but it's like, he said, man, I don't have my best friend there. He said, I just feel lost, you know. There's nobody to share it with. And by the way, if, if you don't get those things on the calendar, they won't happen. <laughs> and and, and those, those fun getaways, those fun things you do, they don't have to be expensive either. Um, you know, that, by the way, that's another motivation to get your finances under control. Uh, you know, some of you young people, I would encourage you, you know, don't go into debt. Listen, I know that, 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 that extra square footage in that house looks awful appealing, but you know what? Life is no fun when you're always working and always broke. Life's just no fun. Life's no fun when you're always working and always broke. You know, and where and we're, everything's just so tight, you never have any opportunity to go do something fun because you're paying for a house or you're paying for a car too much car too much house and so now you don't have any money to just just enjoy life and just have a good time you know and just make good memories life's too short you know so so you know that's motivation to get those finances under control all right number three endeavor to do everyday mundane routine things together together um, and I'm talking about things like grocery shopping. Now, look, grocery shopping, we, when I say we do that together, Denise is like, I got to go uh, and run around the, the, to, uh, the corner to the, to the grocery store. You want to go with me? And I say yes, and I get in the car, and we go together, and I drop her off at the door. Right? And, and she's happy with that. She's like, that's great. We get to talk on the way, talk on the way back. But yeah, just everyday mundane things, just do them together. You know, whether it's running errands, grocery shopping, working in the yard, exercising, walking, those things can actually become fun when they're done together. The next one is this one, serve together. Serve together. Have you guys noticed what the blank is on all those? <laughs> pretty easy to remember huh try and find ways that you can serve together not apart um, I'm, I'm a believer in this hey when, find ways at church that you can serve together you know um, trunk or treat what a great thing you know it's like you know you can you can take these uh, these trunk or treat cards because we're two weeks away now and you can take those uh, those trunk or treat cards and you can say hey let's just w take a walk through the neighborhood and any place that looks like they have kids let's leave a card on the door you know or uh, you can say the night of uh, trunk or treat let's serve together you know let's have a trunk and let's let's have fun looking at the kids costumes and interacting with them and let's do this together honey okay you know and so find ways that you can serve together I remember when our kids were growing up um, they were into sports and and I would coach but Denise didn't just sit at the house while I'm off with the kid you know, we did it together she would be the team mom and she would be the one interacting with the parents and talking to them and and she would be right there with me as we as we did sports together so you know you know serve together whether it's serving in the community whether it's serving at church uh, but but get creative you know and uh, and when I say get creative you know hey I got a lunch break today. Meet me here. Meet me there for lunch. Let's grab lunch together. Or, hey, I got an hour break at 10 a.m. So why don't you come over to my, to my work and, and bring some coffee, and we'll just sit in the car and talk. And maybe the talk will lead to something else. <laughs> <laughs> Denise is like, yeah, it will. <laughs> Be spontaneous, right? Do something together that you didn't plan on. You know, hey, let's go do this. Hey, let's grab a babysitter. Let's go do this tonight. You know, let's go for a walk on the beach. Do something spontaneous. All right, here's some don'ts. You ready? Let me give you these real quick. Here's some don'ts that will kill the social element of your, of your communication. All right, first one, number one, don't allow the TV to dominate your life. And I know that today it's Netflix and it's all these other things. You get the idea, okay? 
turn it off, go for a walk on the beach, enjoy a full moon, just talk on the back porch, but don't allow the TV to dominate your life. Number two, don't allow electronic devices to dominate your life. I am amazed at some of these women that know things in the church before I know them, and I'm the pastor. It's like they must live on social media. It's like, it's unbelievable. And they'll know details of things that I don't even know, you know? And I'm like, how in the world did she know that, you know? And, and it's like they, they must get these notifications. I mean, it's like they got a thousand friends on Facebook and they get notifications whenever post, they post something new. That would drive me insane. It's like, wow. It's like, good night. I, don't even get me started on that. <laughs> that just dominates your life. It's nuts. It's like, listen, these are the enemies of communication, the enemies. I, I, I get tickled. The other day we were in a restaurant, Denise and I, we were out of town, and so we stopped and grabbed a bite to eat. A couple came in and had a seat. I lie not. Until the food came, they never looked at each other. It was, <laughs> never even looked at each other. It's like, wow, they're enjoying a nice meal together. <sighs> it's crazy, you know? And, and I've seen whole families doing that. Have you ever seen families like sitting in an airport or sitting somewhere and, and all four members of the family, they got like two kids and the parents, and they're all doing that, you know? It's hilarious. I just, it's funny, you know? But it's not really funny, but, you know, it's really sad. But these are the enemies of communication. Is it okay to have a computer? Absolutely. Cell phone? Absolutely. But you can let that stuff dominate your life to where you don't have any communication going on anymore. Very little, right? Number three, don't allow another couple family member, or person to dominate your social life. Um, when that happens, you do not have time to bond with your spouse, which is very crucial in marriage. Uh, there are couples who do not have a life with their spouse, and they would love to dominate your life. They would love that. You cannot let that happen. Um, you know, well, I could get started on that. I... Listen, there's a lot of people I love, and a lot of people I love to hang with, but I'm going to tell you something, man. I, I have never wanted to vacation with another family. Clint's laughing. No offense to any of you out there, all right? But, but when, I'm, when I've got downtime and I'm wanting, I, want her, I want her undivided attention. I don't want her talking to another lady. I want her undivided attention. You know, and, and again, that's, I'm just saying, you, you can't let other people, there are certain, there, it's okay to have healthy interaction with other people, but if your social life really doesn't exist apart from another couple or another person, that's not a good thing. There are so, certain couples, they, they never want to do anything fun unless there's another couple involved. I don't think that's healthy. You've got to have that best friendship with your spouse. All right, next thing. Don't allow your children to become the basis of your marriage and togetherness. Um, many couples have problems after the children leave home. Empty nesters, right? More and more couples are divorcing after 30 years of marriage. Um, many couples are divorcing after 50 years of marriage, right? That's hidden in our family. We've seen it. 50 years of marriage and they divorce. Uh, and, and why? Because they, they made the kids the basis and the purpose of their marriage instead of each other. And you can't do that because when the kids leave, what's left? I mean, I love my kids. I love doing things with my kids. I love doing things as a family. Love it. Love it. Always have loved it. But the reality is that my kids are not invited into everything that we do because I am one with Denise. So you have to have a reason to be married. You have to have a reason to be together other than just your kids. Kids living in the house, kids living in the house, typically that's a stage of life in marriage. 
but your marriage is till death do us part. So you absolutely need to regularly do things together as a family, absolutely. But you also have to make sure that you're having that alone time with the two of you. So let's apply this, all right? Look in your handout. It says this. How how do you apply this? If you presently are expending your energies on interests that take you in opposite directions, simply change your interests. That's pretty simple, isn't it? Pretty simple. Um, and, and I know that, that for us, um, when we were young marrieds, and we'd only been married about four years, I was singing in a quartet where we would go out and we'd minister in churches on the weekends. Problem is, Denise and Clint didn't get to go most of the time. And so I would leave on the weekends, and I was having a blast getting to do what I love to do. I always had wanted to sing in a quartet. We were steadily booked on the weekends all the time. So we would go out and we'd be singing at events, you know, different things. And the problem is, is that, like I said, I had to leave them behind. And so finally one day, Denise just told me, she's like, she was crying as I was leaving for another weekend. She's like, you know, my fear is there's going to come a day and there's going to come a time in which I'm not going to care that you're leaving. I am not going to cry because I will have built my life around other things and I won't care and she's crying as she's telling me this and I thought I gotta change do I like to sing yeah do I like to travel yeah but you know what my wife's more important than what I like and so I just I quit I resigned right away after that said I'm done Believe it or not, there are other ways to enjoy life other than the ways that you've always been accustomed to. I mean, there are thousands of possibilities. You could Google hobbies. Just Google that, you know, list of hobbies. You're probably going to get a thousand. So to find a couple on a list of a thousand that you both like shouldn't be that hard, you know, and I just, I really believe that you need to pursue things like that together. Um, In your handout, it says, find things that you mutually enjoy. Find things that you mutually enjoy. You know, have you ever asked your spouse what they would enjoy? Have you taken it for granted, maybe, that they love the same things that you do? In your handout, it says, because there's only so many hours in the day and in the week, couples have to choose. They can pursue interests that they can share, resulting in growing closer together or they can pursue interests that they do not share, resulting in growing apart. Communication. Let's go back to 1 Peter 3.7. Everybody look at it before we close our Bible. It says, Likewise, you husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor, giving great value unto the wife, as unto the weaker vessel. She needs you, right? You need her and she needs you. And as being heirs together, of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Let's go to God in prayer right now.